we're starting a little bit behind schedule uh, compared to what this, uh, the <laughs> plan outlines, but uh, you're in session T10.1, which is on the experience of statistical systems and implementing ICT tools to improve the quality of agricultural statistics for SDG monitoring. Uh, let me start by mentioning that this is actually a co jointly sponsored session by the Asian Development Bank and the uh, FAO uh, regional office in Asia and the Pacific. My name is Nagra Rao, and I'm a statistician at the Asian Development Bank. And I'm Sangeeta Dubey. I'm the new regional statistician for Asia and the Pacific uh, for FAO based out of Bangkok. Excellent. So we're, I'm just going to give a little introduction about the session. Um, the, the genesis of setting up this uh, session is basically that we think, as the Asian Development Bank, and I'm sure the FAO RAP is in agreement, uh, that uh, modern technology has its benefits in terms of improved data collection, data management. Uh, but how do you actually scale it up to national statistics offices is an area of interest, is an area that requires a lot of work. Uh, both our institutions have been working with national statistics offices and other uh, line ministries, such as Ministry of Agriculture, uh, towards improving uh, data collection methods and management using ICT tools, such as CAPI, such as remote sensing. So we have a wonderful panel uh, of uh, presenters uh, coming from three different countries, from Bhutan, from Sri Lanka, and from Vietnam. Uh, so each presenter will get about 15 minutes to present, and uh, we'll be strict about the time limit because we've started a little late. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Sangeeta um, introduce the first presenter from Bhutan. Uh, thank you, Nagraj. The first presentation is using Paradata from CAPI, based data collection activities to support questionnaire design and field operations monitoring. Now, that's a mouthful, but it's basically on how you can use modern technology to, in real time, monitor what's going on in field data collection, identify problems, and introduce quick solutions, which isn't possible when you're monitoring uh, through human beings alone without technology. So without further ado, I'd like to invite um, our two presenters uh, to the, to, um, the front. Uh, to the podium, and I'll give you a little bit of information about them. Mr. Chencho Dukka is the agriculture specialist in the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in Bhutan. It's a little bit of an understatement because he's been uh, de facto the co-supervisor of the first completed agriculture census in Asia and Pacific under the new uh, round, the new methodology of the World Census of Agriculture. Uh, they completed their data collection in record time in March and are currently, uh, mid-April, they started in March and they're currently in it getting ready to launch their main report and findings. A little bit about Chencho. He studied in, um, in Reading University where he did his bachelor's degree in agriculture science, continued with graduate studies at the University of Melbourne in the same subject. In terms of technology use, he's largely self-taught, which is an inspiration to all of us that as professionals, we can continue our own professional development and also with the advent of new technology in providing training materials, it's possible to acquire this expertise does take a bit of effort, sometimes uh, while juggling a busy job. And I'd also like to mention um, another accomplishment of Mr. Dupka. He's also an archer. Um, Co-presenting with him is my colleague, Anthony Burgard, um, also from FAO. Anthony studied uh, economics at the University of Berkeley and did his graduate studies in economics at Chula University in Bangkok. He's been in the UN system for over 10 years in various organizations, and I'm pleased to say for at least the last six with FAO. He is um, our CAPI and technology expert and has been key in developing the partnership with Nikraj. Um, just to deepen that partnership, I'm also pleased to let you know that because of Nikraj's introduction of Anthony to a friend of his, four years later, Anthony is now a married man and will be having his official uh, marriage ceremony both in Bangkok, followed by that in, uh, in the Philippines. So I'd like you to join me in uh, giving Anthony a round of applause for what is probably even a bigger accomplishment than the technology use. 
Over to you, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, good morning. So straight into it. Uh, the title is Using Paradata from CAPI-based data collection activities to support uh, questionnaire design and bill operation monitoring. Okay. So I'll do uh, a couple of slides and then my colleague Anthony will uh, take over from there. To give a brief uh, outline, so we have four parts to this uh, presentation and, and uh, uh, starting with the background, then what is uh, introducing, what is paradata, and then we'll go into how we analyzed this uh, uh, paradata thing and then uh, round up by next steps. So to give a brief background, okay, so Bhutan uh, recently completed its uh, agriculture census, we call it RNR census, uh, Renewable Natural Resources uh, uh, census. It is the third of its kind uh, completed in March with the reference year being uh, 2018, January to December 2018. And in that census, for the first time, we, at least in Bhutan, we used uh, computer assisted personal interviewing, CAPI, uh, using tablets, uh, using CS Pro uh, as the software. Uh, Mr. Anthony uh, from FAO uh, support, he came to Bhutan. Uh, gave us the training, one week training on how to design application using CS Pro. And then after he left, uh, we took out uh, from over there and then uh, designed the uh, thing. And then we uh, did the census uh, using that application. So we will be talking about how uh, actually we will use uh, the paradata inside that, not just the actual data to, to improve our uh, future surveys. To give a brief uh, thing, what is paradata? Basically, it is the data, you know, uh, inside how how the interviewer uh, did his interview. So uh, it's also known as sur uh, survey process data, collects data about the survey process at the micro level. Uh, recent research on the use of paradata has focused on the development of analytic methods to un better understand errors in the data collection process and in gaining insight to the behavioral interactions in the field between enumerators and respondents. The type of paradata collected depends on the data collection modality and software used, but in general, it can include variables uh, such as uh, field entry, uh, which is basically number of times entered, average duration, movement, uh, event frequencies, like how many errors did he uh, commit and then went back, re-entry, equipment and compression used, so that's of the things. Uh, what can we use paradata for? Uh, at the macro level, uh, we can use it to, uh, you know, for performance of, uh, to monitor the performance of the enumerator over the course of the enumeration period. And also uh, GPS uh, accuracy, how it is, uh, you know, capturing. And at the macro level, we can uh, uh, do further uh, insights. It will give us insights on how the interview went and how we can uh, improve in the next time, you see. So uh, this, uh, so we we took for this uh, for the sake of this uh, small study, uh, we took a couple of tablets from our enumerators, and then uh, just basically looked at the CS log file inside that, and uh, it shows actually um, that you know interviewers in the beginning they were taking quite longer time, probably overwhelmed. Then as they went along the uh, interview time gets shortened. That's natural, you know. Of course, uh, within the day to today, tomorrow, it may again uh, differ based on size of the holding. But in general, the, uh, you can see that they were getting more confident to us the, as they went uh, along. Uh, we could also see uh, uh, whether the interviews condu being conducted were going too quickly or not from the paradata. For instance, you know, this graph shows that uh, if, if the, our uh, entire census questionnaire was read like line by line without giving any chance to the respondent to even uh, give you a reply and just read, read, read it, it would take about 10 minutes, 58 seconds. And using that as the baseline, then you can you know, do some analysis. And if it shows that some of the interviews were uh, you know, conducted less than 10 minutes, then these are like sort of warning uh, lights to you saying, hey, why, 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 why you took so much uh, short time to do that? 
And of course, it may again, it may be genuine uh, stuff such as a farmer may have only one cow, he had no crop, nothing else. In such a case, you know, no, 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 no. So you are skipping. It is possible to conduct in less than 10 minutes. But on the other hand, it could also mean some, uh, you know, they were doing some shortcuts. Okay, so from now on, I would like to hand over to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Shou, for helping us to get started this morning. And thank you to the audience for your applause for my upcoming celebrations. <laughs> So in addition to the time variables that are accounted for within the paradata, there's also different types of paradata. So the one of those types is the use of GPS data. So every time we collect a GPS point, you know, we use it through the, the tablet application. In this case, we use uh, CS Pro, which is the census and survey processing uh, system. It gives us a few different um, auxiliary variables or parameters about the, the GPS point that was collected during the time of the interview. And here on this slide, we've listed four of these different variables. So we're looking at altitude, satellite, accuracy, and the read time. And I'll just give you a little bit of introduction of what those four um, terms actually mean. So the first, every time we take a GPS point within the survey, we collect altitude, which is how at what altitude was that GPS point collected. The second is a satellite. And the satellite means is how many satellites was that particular tablet device used for collecting the data was collected to during the time of the interview. Now, generally, there is a bit of a correlation here where we expect that if it's connected to a higher number of satellites, we expect a bit of a higher accuracy. The third term is the notion of accuracy. And the notion of accuracy here is expressed in terms of meters. <coughs> meters. Now, <coughs> Uh, I'll, let me uh, go back a little bit and introduce this concept of how we uh, describe the issue of accuracy. Now, every time, so let's say, for instance, that you open your uh, mobile phone and you open Google Maps in particular. When you open Google Maps, you'll often be presented with a small blue dot sh showing some indication to where you are relative to the map or location uh, presented on the screen. Now, sometimes it's a bit hard to get a very to actually verify that that blue point is actually where you are standing. So sometimes Google will show a bit of a circle. And this circle we call as the circle of probable error. So that what that circle imp is trying to convey to you, the user, is that, that your true location may be that circle, the blue point on the screen, but it could also be anywhere within the larger blue circle. And the larger that circle determines how accurate <coughs> is how the accuracy measure is determined in the uh, CS Pro application. So if we have a larger circle, that means that the, the potential, um, the true location of where that interview is taking place may be a much larger range. Okay, And then finally is the read time, is basically how long it takes to acquire that particular GPS coordinate. Okay. And all these four uh, points are relatively interrelated and correlated in some way. Now, we have been able to use some of these variables to help verify the accuracy of our data points that were collected in the 2019 RNR census uh, in terms of the use of altitude. So what th one of the things that we can do is we can correlate this with, uh, say, topographical maps to verify whether the interview itself was taking place in that particular uh, maybe temporary climate zone. <coughs> we can use the satellite and accuracy measures to get a sense as to how accurate and how um, trustworthy our GPS coordinates can be were. And in terms of read time is how much of a burden did the, the use did the collection of that GPS coordinate add to the overall interview? Okay. okay. So one of the things that we did in our analysis was to look at the, um, the accuracy measures across the country for the RNR census. And here I just showed uh, a kind of like a, a heat map distribution of these accuracy measures. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Bhutan, Bhutan is a very highly mountainous country. And the collection of an accurate GPS point is very much dependent on environmental factors. So if we are taking GPS coordinates in a very dense forest location where there is uh, no clear view of the sky, or if the interviewer is taking the interview within the household, that may be blocking the GPS signal, it may be more difficult to get an accurate reading signal. So uh, 
just uh, if we take a look at the, the map over here, we can, s um, it, we can see that there are certain hot spots throughout the country, uh, particularly maybe more rural, uh, mountainous regions of the country where it was more difficult to get an accurate reading of the GPS measure. Okay. Uh, one of the features that we did build into the application itself is the <coughs> uh, we restricted the time uh, the interviewer can spend in trying to acquire a signal. So one of the things with, uh, because we're looking at an interview duration of about 20 minutes in total, right? If we introduce a GPS question, that GPS question can take upwards of one minute to collect, not including the time it takes to re-enter that, uh, recollect that signal. Uh, <coughs> so it's a quite an added burden to actually capture this information. And one of the thing, one of the questions that we had is, by adding this question, how what, kind, what is the quality of the measurements that we're getting out of it? And most importantly, what can we use this data for? Okay. Another feature of the uh, GPS data collection, uh, sorry, is that uh, in Bhutan, one of the things that we found was that many of the interviewers were taking many of the interviews were taking place in a group setting in a very clustered fashion. Sometimes uh, the enumerators themselves were just filling out the questionnaire in their, in their own homes after the end of the day because they preferred to use the paper uh, questionnaires during the interview itself and preferred to just uh, type in the answers later after the interview. It was just made more, it was, they were just more comfortable with that fact. And we, we saw some evidence of this uh, within the, from the pair data itself, is seeing that there are different sp uh, cluster spots throughout the country where uh, interviewers may have preferred to uh, conduct the interview within a short time span in a very clustered setting. However, that being said, there are legitimate reasons why there may be cluster points of GPS coordinates. So one of the, the, the nice um, stories that I've been told is that uh, when we get to the more uh, rural or mountainous regions in the country, towards the north in particular, uh, it's very difficult for the enumerators to actually travel to each individual agricultural holding. So one of the things they have to do is, and these uh, particular types of holdings are yak herders, right? They're more nomadic style. So one of the things here is that we ha they had to call these uh, herders uh, down to a central region to perform the interviews. And so the, the interviews could be conducted in a more timely manner. And this just gives you a little bit of an overview of the methodology that we used uh, for <coughs> uh, identifying these points. Here we use kind of like a GIS technique to kind of, <coughs> um, we're basically just drawing a, s a, n a number of circles on the map. And we're trying to figure out how many of those GPS points fall within a certain circle size. Okay. Okay. So for the first part of this interview, of uh, this uh, presentation, we've covered, uh, we're looking at Paradata at a macro view, looking at field monitoring as a whole. Now we want to kind of want to switch gears to look at how do we, what are the Paradata available, is available to, ident to look at the individual questions themselves. So one of the things that uh, CS Pro allows us to do is to look at the screen on time measured in the number of seconds that that screen is on during the interview. And we have that, we have a, a, a timing for each individual uh, question or section. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of research has been done in this area and a lot of the research has been done in the area of um, question response time. Now, uh, it's hard to say that question response time, okay, Ooh, okay, okay, two minutes. <laughs> So basically, I'll, I'll maybe I'll just quickly go over this slide. So here we're looking at uh, how long, what is the duration the screen was on for each particular question of the questionnaire. And one of the, the more interesting um, aspects that we've found, for beginning on each section of the questionnaire, interviewers tend to spend much longer on the first question. Now uh, the, the reason for this is because interviewers are trying to explain a change in the section or trying to explain some of the concepts that are, on, that are coming up within the rest of the questionnaire. So you'll see that the first question on each of the, the sections, if you go through the data, uh, it tend to take a bit longer. Okay. 
And this is a, a different section. So here, I wanted to go back to our analysis of looking at uh, the, the how long it takes to, how long the screen was on for a particular question, and compare it to how long it would take to read the question. Uh, so you can see that usually, and for this particular section, uh, the questions took around two to three seconds to actually recite the question word for word. Because during training uh, for this particular r and census, one of the points that was emphasized is that the in interviewer should recite uh, the, uh, the question as closely as possible to the questionnaire because we have spent so much time already to discuss how to formulate these questions in, in the manner that we listen a response that we require. So this is kind of one of our initial attempts to try to break down uh, this screen, this concept of screen on time to better reflect how much time it really takes to actually get a response from the respondent. Um, we're, we're trying to eventually get to a point where we can kind of see what is the mental load, how much thinking time is required to give a response to the enumerator. Okay. Now, one of the, the other aspects is we're looking, okay, we're, other aspects is we're looking at screen on time across different question types. So here we've done some a little initial analysis of looking at uh, how long it takes to respond to different types of questions, looking at checkbox questions, uh, single select type questions, we're selecting one response from a, <coughs> a list, and how long it takes to uh, respond to text-based questions. And one of the unique features of this r and census is that we actually introduced an innovation where we, in, aside from the main respondent, we are also asking a question to a proxy respondent. So one of the analysis that we did on the side here was to look at how long it takes for the main respondent to answer the same question as uh, comparing to the proxy respondent. And this will be a subject of an upcoming paper uh, coming soon. Uh -huh. uh, the, well, um, in addition to all these time variables, we also have what we call event frequency variables, or error messages, or the number of times certain questions were uh, entered into the application. So here, in a typical fact, uh, typical uh, way, uh, a lot of the errors in usually come as a result of questions asking the enumerator to uh, add up to some total. So here we had some issues in. <coughs> uh, looking at uh, different areas of different subgroups of different types of land. So these are the kind of things that we can try to begin to look at uh, where the problems are in the questionnaire and how do we improve the, the asking of these questions um, for future surveys. Okay. We can do the same for uh, re-entry, how many times a question was re-entered. And then finally, I'll hand it over to uh, Chencho, who will be taking all the next steps from this analysis. Uh, yeah, literally, one minute. <laughs> so uh, because it will, as a Putinist, I have to now see the next steps for Bhutan, you see, uh, instead of Anthony. <laughs> so what are we going to do next? We will be uh, further analyz analyzing this. Uh, we will get some more tablets uh, from our field colleagues and then uh, get look into the uh, CS log and do some more of uh, what we have done uh, here. And uh, further areas of study could be Comparing, you know, for example, what he said, uh, question response times between respondent and proxy uh, respondents, uh, use cases of GPS point coordinates in future agricultural statistical activities. Uh, how does the assessment of paradata impact the interpretation, interpretation of our census uh, uh, survey results? For instance, if we find too many interviews wherein they have taken uh, less than 10 minutes, like I earlier said, then uh, we ought to really question ourselves, hey, on should we uh, even uh, report such things, things like that. Thank you very much. Who's also, uh, Manisha Suba is also from the government of Bhutan. Uh, Manisha studied in Bangalore University statistics. Uh, she's a statistical officer that was actively involved as well in this R&R census. Uh, Manisha has been working for five years and has accomplished a great deal as a young statistician. And uh, I also want to mention that her hobby is um, painting. 
So with that, Manisha is going to be presenting the next paper on women's ownership of agriculture land, an SDG indicator 5A1, using CAPI to sample respondents in Bhutan's agriculture census. Manisha? Um, thank you, um, Ma'am Sangeeta, for uh, the wonderful in introduction. Uh, good morning. My name is Manisha. Uh, of course, she introduced. Uh, and uh, I'll be presenting on women's ownership of agricultural land and SDG indicator 5.8.1 using CAPI to sample respondents in Bhutan's agricultural census. So this is Bhutan. Uh, it is located between two large countries, China and India. It's basically sandwiched between the two. And Bhutan is a small country with merely 7 million people, uh, and it is a largely agrarian, agrarian country, which, uh, and agriculture contributes to 17.4% of its GDP and employs about 54% of the population in the agriculture sector, and over which uh, over 60% of the total population lives in rural area. Females, females make up to 47 of the population, and out of which 45.2% of the, uh, makes up about 45.2% of the labor force, of which 63% 63 of the individuals uh, are employed in agriculture sector. So, uh, according to the constitution of the Kingdom of Bhutan 2008, all persons are equal before the law and are entitled to equal and effective protection of the law and shall not be discriminated against on the ground of race, sex, language, religion, politics, or other status, which means that we are, uh, Bhutan has uh, the gender equality concept enshrined in in our constitution, and we also have our uh, plans and programs based on uh, integrated uh, on the gender equality being integrated in our plans and programs. The Bhutan uh, R uh, R N R Renewable Natural Resource Census 2019. It is all uh, was already being covered. The content of the uh, RNR census is, was being already co um, being uh, covered by the earlier presenter. Um, but just to go on, uh, uh, Bhutan's agriculture uh, census usually constitute or uh, uh, it agriculture constitute of livestock, agriculture, and forestry, <coughs> and it as is referred to as RNR uh, renewable natural resources in Bhutan. The RNR, uh, 2000, RNR Census 2019 conducted uh, in March and April 2019 was Bhutan's third such census. The earlier one was conducted in 2000. Uh, uh, the first one was con conducted in 2000, followed by uh, the second one in 2009. And it's the first in Asia Pacific to, uh, to conduct its uh, census in conformity with the World, Agri World Census of agriculture 2020 methodology and to use tablet-based computer-assisted personal interviewing method to include questions for compiling SDG indicator 5.8.1 to pilot CAPI-based sampling of household members for 5.8.1. So I guess Bhutan is doing a good job while Mr. Petro yesterday was m mentioning how uh, how the world or uh, the uh, all the globe globally only one point uh, one by thirty eight indicators were on track. So uh, uh, going back to what uh, how I mentioned about women about sixty three percent of the uh, population uh, women were in the rural area was being uh, employed in agriculture sector. In the recent, we 
uh, recent preliminary results from the RNR census, it was found that more women continue to contribute in agricultural labor. More female than men are in active and productive working age population. And we can see that in the chart here. I don't know if it's visible, but the uh, the, cha uh, the red red bar shows the female and the blue bar shows the male. So we can see that this is the population demography from the uh, 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 the population that were engaged in agriculture. So we can see that women are largely uh, women are more in in the working age uh, population and even more so uh, among those that declared their occupation as farmer uh, women were more predominant so uh, this uh, the next uh, age distribution of among farmers uh, sh uh, uh, shows that women are are even more so we can say that uh, of course uh, it is a general idea that uh, farmer uh, i mean farming has become feminized so this uh, prove, uh, proves further proves the phenomenon of fem feminization uh, okay so under the uh, Arctic, uh, land act of bhutan 2007 article 16 Chaz, uh, Chaza Satram, hereafter referred to as Trump, shall be sole res authoritative document that shall record and establish the legitimacy of title of land of a person in the country. So this, this, uh, this, this is a certificate, legal document that sh uh, uh, that has a con uh, that has the content where. Uh, we have uh, the name of the holder, and the name of the owner of the uh, la uh, the land, uh, the uh, location of the land, the uh, the area of the land, the type of lo ownership, and uh, and uh, who all, uh, if it is owned uh, jointly, who all are the owner. So the land are uh, the land is uh, the land registry is uh, largely categorized under uh, these uh, categories. Uh, so we will be focusing more on individual per individual person, family land, and joint ownership because we deal with the agricultural land ownership. Uh, getting into the uh, agricultural land ownership and the SDG 5.8, the uh, goal five uh, aims to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Uh, under uh, And under the target 5.8, it aims to undertake reforms to give women equal rights to economic resources as well as access to ownership and control over land and other forms of property, financial services, inheritance, and natural resources in accordance with national law. Um, further, uh, since FAO is the custodian of the uh, SDG indicator 5.8.1, I would like to uh, request Ma'am Sangeeta to please uh, explain further on the SDG indicator 5.8.1. This is not, uh, there we go. Um, so I'll go relatively quickly through the next slides. As Pietro was mentioning yesterday, um, indicator 5A1 has no data in the global database, which means no country has yet reported. Um, it's important to understand that it's not that complicated an indicator. It is referring to the agriculture population defined by agriculture households. And the issue at stake is for these agriculture households, what proportion of men and what proportion of women have access to secure access to, to land, uh, which is measured both by ownership but also by long-term leases. So under sub-indicator A, there is a separate calculation ma made for women and a separate one made for men. Uh, for each sex, it's the percentage of that sex in the adult agriculture population that have ownership or sec secure rights. Next slide. Subsector B then looks at women compared to men. So the number of women with ownership or secure rights over agriculture land divided by the total number of people with ownership or secure rights over agriculture land. 
Um, in asking these questions, there was quite a bit of intensive research done by the EDGE project, which is a multi-agency project called the Evidence and Data for Gender Equality Project. And they tested both how to collect information on ownership of assets, but also what types of questions make sense. And there's two proxies that are used. One is proxy questions. So the finding was to ask someone directly, do you own an asset, wasn't giving the right results. Instead, it went to three proxies. One is having a legal certificate, a second is having the right to sell, and the third is having the right to bequeath or designate an heir. And these three proxies, any one of which can measure much more accurately secure ownership. So these are the three questions that tend to be asked. Now, of course, they're not mutually exclusive, so it's an or. If any of these questions are answered in the affirmative and they're yes, no questions, then that person has secure ownership rights. Uh, in addition to these proxy questions then, the, the issue for countries is what do we actually put as questions? So it is asking after the question on do you own agriculture land, do you have, is your name on a legally recognized document? In some areas, the types of documents are listed. You'll find when Manisha continues that that wasn't necessary in Bhutan because it has a well-developed registry system with one type of uh, le legal system for ownership. The second question on the right to sell was, do you have the right to sell your land, either singly or jointly? And the third is, do you have the right to bequeath or designate your heir, either singly or jointly? So with these three questions on the left-hand side that are used to actually measure ownership or secure rights, uh, the government of Bhutan looked at their own land registry system and translated it based on the system that exists, the system of thrums. And I will give the mic back to Manisha to continue. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, so uh, looking at the proxy questions, we developed our own uh, questions based on what the what was recommended. So our question was, is your name really in listed as an owner or, or on one or more thumb, Trump? So here, Trump, uh, as mentioned earlier, is the um, legal registry certificate. So here, so one or more thumb, here Trumps provide the right to sell or bequeath. If it's an individual, uh, ownership, you have right and uh, own, uh, you have right to sell, right to bequeath, and if it's uh, the joint ownership, you have uh, you have to have joint uh, jointly right, you have joint rights to sell and bequeath, and likewise for in a family membership, uh, family member ownership, uh, the the name of the uh, the the registry is being owned uh, by the uh, by the head of the household while uh, th the other member of fa family still has the right over the land. So these uh, three questions, uh, so is your name listed as an owner or on one or more trump? This, uh, if yes, what type of trump it, is it? Is it sing individual or joint or family based? If no, are you a family member for a trump, for a family? for a family ownership. Okay, so uh, the next slide, uh, okay, so this, uh, the next slide uh, talks about who do we ask the data, uh, we, how do we ask the data from? So this is what is recommended from FAO. So we ask uh, one proxy respondent that is normally asking the uh, respondent about the whole, pop, uh, whole uh, situation of the whole uh, family member, and the second uh, second uh, method is self-respondent uh, approach, where all members of the family are being asked this question, and the third is self-respondent approach applied to one member, or where or where only one randomly selected member of the family is being uh, asked the ex asked this question. In terms of Bhutan, or uh, uh, since uh, the census was already going on. We we asked the respondent and as well the some the randomly selected member of the family. So uh, in this way, it covers the whole uh, the the three aspects altogether. So this is uh, how we, uh, the question was generally asked: uh, if uh, the the household had uh, 
land, uh, if they owned the land, uh, then it, uh, they ask to, to the, thank you, uh, to the uh, respondent, is your name listed as an owner or of the one or more trams? And then if it is yes, then they ask what type of tram is it? Okay, so I'll uh, just skip the, this chart. Uh, this is normally how the question was asked to the first and the second respondent. Uh, uh, getting to the results, um, so this uh, this this results uh, is from the uh, how the responses were from the for the re from the main respondent. So we can see that. Uh, from the, uh, the women uh, constitute about 46 uh, percent of the population the, uh, of the whole uh, from the um, uh, respondents uh, 46 percent were female and um, and about uh, 40 uh, 45 percent of the population uh, of the uh, women had right uh, over the land and they owned land and about 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 92% uh, uh, of the total number of women, 92% uh, had the access and right over the la agricultural land. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, results from the uh, randomly selected, <coughs> uh, randomly selected respondent. So where. Uh, 43 person again was uh, female, uh, and uh, and uh, 42 person had the access to secure land, and 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 82 person of the uh, 82 person of the number of uh, total number of women had access and rights over the agricultural land. So in conclusion, a uh, relatively higher degree of gender equality. And there was a higher degree of uh, gender equality in land uh, ownership in Bhutan. And uh, to, as a next step, we want, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is just a preliminary results. And uh, we have more work to do. Of, and what we want to do for next is for randomly selected, uh, re we want to check uh, the responses from the uh, second, uh, the selected, uh, we have another question, uh, the third question saying, uh, was the respondent, the randomly selected uh, respondent present or not? From there, we want to check if the, uh, what was the responses from the proxy and the direct responses disaggregated by sex. And next is, to, uh, so here there was this confusion that since, uh, uh, since Land ownership, uh, this uh, here we talk of the SDG 5.8 talks about agriculture, ownership over agriculture land. But uh, while we ask the question in the RNA, uh, uh, RNA census, we, we, had, we asked uh, the question, but uh, since we had a notion that we assumed that all the uh, land that the farming population owned was agricultural land, we, we were not, uh, uh, we, ha we uh, forgot that part. Example like, what about agriculture op operators who have non-agricultural terms used for agriculture activity? So these are things that um, we need to look further on. And also uh, we, for the randomly selected uh, respondent, we, need, uh, we have to check the unbiasedness uh, of the sample. Uh, so th that will be the future uh, step forward. Uh, and uh, f uh, that ends my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry for rushing. And thank you for being patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Manisha.
just a little note to the next two speakers. We have Pamela Lapitan. Pamela, raise your hand. She'll be keeping time right there, so she'll be showing you little placards of how much time is left for you. So let's try to stick to the time limits that have been provided. Uh, from the mountainous train of Bhutan, we're going to move to the beaches of Sri Lanka in a matter of seconds. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Karya Wasam Sarat Sadhananda from the Department of Census and Statistics in Sri Lanka. Mr. Sadhananda is the director of the Agriculture and Environmental Statistics Division at the Department of Census and uh, Statistics. He has a bachelor's degree from Sri Jayavardhanapura University uh, in mathematics, statistics, and physics, two postgraduate diplomas, and a master's in applied statistics from the University of Colombo. Uh, Mr. Sadhananda is going to talk about uh, Sri Lanka's experience with implementing uh, CAPI-based surveys on, an, an, uh, on the Agricultural Household Survey, where they did a randomized experiment uh, in one uh, district, which is Anuradhapura district, to look at the benefits, to quantify the benefits of CAPI versus PAPI. Uh, you're not going to get regressions in this presentation, but some very nice charts and figures and uh, lots of interesting insights. So over to you, Mr. Sadhananda. Thank you, Dr. Nagraj. Uh, good morning. Uh, my uh, topic is uh, computer assisted personal interviewing in agriculture, a pilot survey, national survey in Sri Lanka. Uh, as a first time we did this type of survey, uh, normally we did the surveys like uh, uh, income and expenditure, uh, Sri Lanka uh, labor post survey, then a child activity, uh, demographic and health survey. All surveys are the demographic surveys and collect information of demographic information of the household. As a first time, we did this type of survey. The outline of the introduction, pen and paper interviewing, computer as, uh, assisted personal interviewing, uh, research objective, the agriculture household survey, methodology, result, and implication for the future uh, survey implications. Vision 2025 is the national development plan of the government of Sri Lanka that aim to make a country more prosperous. It is aligned with the sustainable development goals with encompass 17 goals with 232 indicators. The DCS of Sri Lanka's mission is to provide data more effectively through new technology. However, the data, the survey, and census is preliminary collected using the pen and paper interviewing system. Under the pen, pen and paper interviewing system, we use of data accuracy and long survey duration. Actually, the enumerators needs table and chair to record data. And respondents also have to spend their time for given data. And uh, manual processing of encoding, the, the second group have to do the manual editing and coding in addition to the enumerator. Then third group have to do data entry activities. Uh, and and uh, at the data processing stage, we have faced more problems to clear data, and we have to take several times error, error prints to clear data. And there is the data availability and analysis. Therefore, we have to face this problem delay in data releasing. Computer, uh, at the computer assisted at, uh, personal interviewing refers to the use of computers, particularly handheld devices like tablets and smartphones in data collection and survey management. Can help enhance the statistical capacity by providing timely, easy accessibility and high quality data. Th this is the workflow for the CAPI and PAPI workflow. The questionnaire and manual preparation, it is needed for those types. And requirement of person, recruitment of the personnel, the training of enumerators. 
then the next stage printing of questionnaire and manual we spent uh, more time to print the questionnaire and we have to uh, it is uh, very cost and it is not to do for the KP system and we need to dow uh, download the forms into the tablet. Then sending questionnaires and manuals to field. It is uh, time compute consuming and very cost for the transportation. But that state is not necessary for the CAPI. Then uh, field work have to do in the both methods. Then supervisor editing have to be done to the CAPI, but it is uh, CAPI, but it is not necessary to the uh, CAPI. Uh, then uh, sending a questionnaire to headquarters. It is also, as the uh, all, uh, previously mentioned, it is not necessary for uh, the CAPI and it is enough to upload the forms to the server. Then data entry and coding, already I mentioned it, it's not necessary for the CAPI and machine editing uh, in both parts and data analysis in the both. This is our first survey, agriculture household survey, a survey that aimed to complete, compile the data on agriculture production and private food gain stock of household in Sri Lanka, capturing indicators such as cost of production, waste and farm gate price among others. It also aims to examine prevalence of non-communicable diseases among agriculture household members. It is very crucial problem in the country because they are using uh, chemicals for the agriculture activities. In indicators of AHS include the following. Agriculture household production by type of crops and livestock. Household food stocks. Uh, producer prices. Production cost of selected crops. Identify uh, farmer-oriented problems, identify market-oriented problems, of, and so on. Research objectives. Objective of this study is to quantify and provide evidence of the benefits of CAPI compared to PAPI. The following are, does CAPI help reduce the number of errors made in the questionnaire? What are the cost implications of uh, switching to the CAPI and how the respondents with purview CAPI. In implementation in Anuradhapura district in the north central province of Sri Lanka during the Maha season of 2017. Uh, this, uh, Anuradhapura district is uh, far from the capital of Colombo and it is a, a remote area and most of the uh, people are engaged in agriculture activities and uh, maha season mean uh, our, uh, we have the uh, uh, cultivation year and it is somewhat different from the calendar year uh, the first season is called the maha season and the second season is called the yellow season uh, the capi and peppy randomization uh, we did a random uh, experiment as a, a Control group CAPI and treatment uh, CAPI. Uh, this is an enumeration area. Uh, within each enumeration area, a random sample of households are allocated to the treatment and control groups. Both groups are given in same survey questionnaires. The households selected as control are uh, interviewed using the pen and paper into a method and other group have interviewed by the CAPI system. Uh, this is the sample size, uh, 100 and uh, in both parts, we used 191 PSUs, then uh, 1,780 uh, uh, households and like that. Distributed comparison of analysis. Uh, upon successful uh, implementation of randomization, the four dimension in this study are compared by their respective mode of data collection and demographic characteristic. Furthermore, mean and proportion are used to 
uh, quantify the extent of benefits from uh, transitioning from CAPI to CAPI. Uh, the four dimensions are uh, time efficiency, data quality, uh, cost efficiency, and respondent uh, perceptions. The four types of errors can be seen uh, as uh, skip errors, data validation errors, logic, and uh, minimize, uh, missing errors. The total errors can be uh, categorized as this. And the cost analysis, uh, this is actually uh, equilibrium stage uh, to the uh, break-even point. Uh, FC denoted by the fixed cost and uh, denoted by variable cost. The variable cost de in, uh, depends on the number of questionnaires. And fixed cost uh, focus to the uh, uh, software and programming. Uh, perception on CAPI, at the end of the survey, a seven question question survey was con uh, conducted. Response are uh, tabulated and computed the file appropriation and uh, segregated by mode of data collection. This is the results of the survey. Uh, comparing demographic and household characteristics, household uh, in the characteristics, sex of the household head by data collection, mode of data collection, it is, uh, we can see a significant difference uh, between these two methods. And histogram for the age for household survey, uh, there is also the, we can't see a significant difference among age of the persons. The marital status of the household heads by mode of data collection, the same as no significant difference in both methods. Uh, source of drinking water by mode of uh, data collection, uh, also the no significant difference. And toilet facilities are not a difference in the both. And sex, this is the second part of the survey. Actually, we did two surveys by using one questionnaire. Uh, and this is the second part, sex of the operator by mode of data collection. We can see significant difference of them. And the same as age distribution and no significant difference in the marital status of the operator. And the above charts and tables illustrate the similarities in the demographic and household characteristics of CAPI and PEPI. Comparing the magnitude of error, uh, you can see uh, the few number of errors can be seen in, under the CAPI and PEPI is number of errors in both part in the uh, uh, household survey and operator survey. And this is understanding. This is uh, B, B to G module for the household information and I to Q for the operator information and R for the uh, uh, perception of the uh, uh, respondent. Then you can see there are the difference between the errors for CAPI and PEPI. Now, this is the total error. Actually, uh, there are, uh, we can see the significant difference between the CAPI and PEPI. The average number of errors, no errors in with the edge. You can see the red for CAPI and uh, blue for PEPI. The other thing is that the, uh, the first one for the uh, uh, household and second one for the uh, operator. Uh, you can see this one. The level of the level of education error has declined. The uh, survey to survey linking. When we link the uh, module uh, first part of the survey to the second part, there are number of errors in CAPI but no errors in uh, CAPI. The reason is that we can do it by the programming, uh, not like the uh, manually. manually. Uh, within the survey, you can see the J to K. Uh, 
uh, especially the i, j and k for the operator and i module to the uh, plot of land, then j uh, to the uh, seasonal crops and k to the extra information of the seasonal crops. This is the survey cost. Then under FC, uh, software is really uh, downloaded and programming cost is higher in CAPI. It is lower to the CAPI, but, uh, the, but variable cost is higher to PEPI and it is lower to the uh, CAPI. And it is the, the important point is this, this is the, uh, the break even point for the number of 1,467 households. This is the uh, cost is equal, but, but in our survey we uh, did for 25,000 households and it is cheaper for the CAPI system. Uh, this one is very important one. Uh, persons, uh, perceptions of there are uh, seven questions to the uh, respondent perceptions, but somewhat different uh, results in the, in the uh, question. Uh, uh, first one is the, what did you think the duration of the interview? Uh, very short, short length of just right long, uh, but the capy persons, were satisfied with the survey. The main reason for this is the, this is the remote area. The majority are, uh, are engaging in agriculture. Uh, their knowledge is very few about the technology. Uh, it is revealed that we need to uh, acknowledge them about the uh, modern technologies. Uh, Information for the people for the sample surveys, uh, CAPI reduced errors by 90%, by 50% for the complex operator survey. Furthermore, CAPI was significantly more successful in survey to survey and within the survey linking. Implication for the further uh, implementation, cost should not implement future scale to the CAPI. Despite higher fixed cost for CAPI, this is offset by this uh, lower variable cost. Actually, uh, we use this machine after this survey to the other surveys, and totally it is cheaper to now. And uh, now we are doing uh, cost of living to collect information about the cost of living and uh, producers uh, prices. Uh, and uh, Sri Lanka labor force survey, the same machine. And one machine can use several years for several surveys. The perception survey showed that CAPI, PAPI was better <coughs> per view than the PAPI, the terms interview, the satisfaction and enjoyment. Already I explained the reason. And oh. are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Sadhana. Thank you, Mr. Sadhananda, for your uh, presentation and also for uh, sticking to the time limit. Uh, if you want more information about the work that's been done, there's uh, little handbooks out there uh, which uh, highlight our experience in Vietnam and in Sri Lanka. Uh, so you can read more about the results there. Uh, we're going to move very quickly to the next presenter. But actually, before that, I'll also mention one more thing. There's a session at 2 o'clock. Uh, it's T28. Uh, which is on technologies for data collection. So the same results that you've seen in terms of very nice visuals, graphics, telling you a compelling story about errors and uh, costs and so on and so forth, you're going to be able to see it in an econometric framework uh, at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, I'm sorry, at 4 p.m. today. So that's uh, going to be presented. Uh, and also the software that was used in, I believe, in all three countries is CS Pro. Uh, okay, so we're going to move uh, quickly to the next presentation, uh, which is also from, uh, which is from Vietnam. Uh, the name of the presenter is uh, Dr. Phan Si Hu. Uh, 
So Dr. Hughes studied at the Hanoi National Economics University uh, at the School of Economics and at the School of Economics uh, at University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, he's the Deputy Director uh, of Analysis and Forecast Division at the Center for Informatics and Statistics of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Vietnam. Uh, a lot of his research has actually focused on reviewing agricultural policies and data sets in Vietnam, uh, and he's been working on the quarterly forecast reports for rice, uh, pork, cashew, rubber, pepper, fishery, and catfish. Uh, he also conducts a lot of trainings on statistics and forecasting for his institution. Uh, he will be presenting on behalf of his colleague, uh, Mr. Hien, who's the head of the agency who could not unfortunately make it, uh, and talk about how to estimate rice yields using satellite data in one pilot province of Vietnam. So over to you, Dr. Hugh. So, <coughs> good morning, delegates. So I will go very quickly because my presentation have a 37 slide and I have only 15 minutes. Uh, so the outlines of my presentation, you can see introduction, methodology, design, and discussion and conclusion. Here are research partner. We have a one, two, three, four, and five research partner with us. And the motivation for our project is a uh, right is key food for billion people, uh, especially the poor people. Uh, we uh, refer to the traditional methods that we hear from other presenters. So administrative data meet many difficulty, especially for my case. I doing it in the last 20 years. I meet many trouble to get the higher quality data. So I prefer the updated technology to apply for the survey in the future. So I talk about my graph, a brief uh, description of our statistic uh, system inside the mini uh, inside Vietnam. And here is uh, my diagram about data flow through agriculture. So you can see it's too complicated. Even I work for many years, but I still don't know where it <laughs> is, how to use this. <laughs> and here is a, the way that we store data in different way. So it is very hard for us to know where it is, how to collect them, how to connect to other people to take the data, the data set. And some quick point, you can see here the same name but unclear concept, data are different from data source. And you can see this is similar to other speakers when we, we conduct the administra administrative <coughs> survey data. So here is the remote sensing. It may be the, an alternative for us. The objective of the study, finally, to give a suggestion about the method to have a better data for right production and timing province is a position and it's a rice bucket of the Red River Delta in Vietnam and have uh, some the position of the two big rice production in Vietnam, Red River Delta and Mekong River Delta is in uh, yellow color. And here you can see how we can get the data from state line so we have uh, three source, MODIS, Landsat, and ALOS2 image. So in other column, you see uh, the characteristics of the state line image. So in summary, the higher spatial resolution, we have a better image. And we have a uh, line SA is a uh, with microwave, it's better in terms of <coughs> observing thing existed on the surface. It are not affected by the cloud. And the short way and the long way, long way is not good because it go through the tree. It does not reflect back. So it is an electric monitor spectrum. It's a, you can see it's a long, long, and people only have a 
a very narrow, narrow gap that we can see on our da daily lives. So s short way reflect the crop, and long way reflect the surface of land. And state line usually you microwave. So this is a method that we use to predict the potential of uh, pet disease. So the function it look complicated, but in fact it like petty. Uh, there is, is a part of which of old crop and other above the ground. <coughs> so here is a four method that we com <coughs> compare the, the data from uh, uh, different types of state life image. So on the left hand side for Landsat, we have a fewer image, but on the right hand side for Modit, we have a more, um, more image in time and for but for the resolution in the left hand side is better than in the right hand side so it is a methodology to combine the two types of, of uh, image and it is a the, the methodology we get feeling to take the picture from the left to the right and here is the the method that we calculate the uh, NDVI. NDVI is simply it like the my small explanation on the right hand side. It have value value from one to zero one to plus one, and each value it refer to to what we see on the earth. And here is we have a six type of land classification. So when we Look at the picture, the green color means paddy area. So this is a method, the methodology that we calculate for the productivity. And when we look at the map and the graph, and we see NDVI is higher in April and October when paddy is harvested. So when we, do, we selected 256 random sample uh, to do the <coughs> to do the crop cutting to, to measure the productivity of paddy and then compare to NDVI value. So it is a procedure that we did for crop cutting. And here we compare those together. So the diagram look complicated, but generally crop cutting there has not strongly related to high heat value of NDVI. And in particularly, crop cut there for popular variety we seed 51 had a strong related to the high heat value of NDVI in Taiping province. And com compare crop cutting with their estimates by using the allot number two. Uh, generally, the crop cut there had weakly relationship with allot number two. So re the reason is. Uh, because allot is a uh, long ways. It's not suitable for to estimate the zero. So in the map, you see higher zero, higher zero mean color moving from purple to red. And the reason state library estimate and fields data you can see on, on the normal curve on the right hand side. So for me, the curve of the, of the state by estimate look better, more similar to the, the bell curve. So conclusion, so data fusion provide a viable approach to provide good resolution data in both space and time for tropical reasons. And IoT for agriculture, uh, like field sensor, drawn meteorological information, will be promi pro promising. So that this data for development TI in FII to do will explore the tool. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hugh, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, now open up the floor to some Q&A on the four presentations. Um, we will entertain a maximum of four just to keep, um, uh, to be conscious of time. So uh, I saw one hand raised there. So can you introduce yourself and ask your question, please? Yeah. I'm Dr. Kosta Vajitya from ISRI. 
and uh, I'm working in the field of sample survey for last nine years and uh, developed a lot of theory. I'm generally working for development of theory and research publications. So uh, the thing I just want to ask uh, about the remote sensing paper that they presented, that what would you implement in your country whenever the things come, like prop cutting experiments or this forecasting method based on remote sensing? We'll take the second question and uh, he'll, uh, they'll answer sir, them. I at have the, yeah. one more question. Okay. Uh, uh, I think everybody is uh, well acquainted with CAPI, the survey solutions that has been discussed over here. So I just want to ask one question. What about the security of the data? Means wherever it is stored and how to access is the data, who is able to access the data? That thing is there. Thank you. Uh, anyone else has a question? I see one hand at the back. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony. I was presenter number one. <laughs> so my question is our to our colleagues in Sri Lanka. And um, I found it very interesting to compare the errors in the, the CAPI versus the PAPI. But my question is, how do you, what constitutes an error in the PAPI? How do you identify that error? In the, did you do it in the field? Did you instruct the enumerators to was it done in post-processing after the data has been collected and returned to the main office or not? We're gonna have, I think this is a place for uh, not the presenters, but for uh, the audience to actually ask questions. So we're gonna entertain a question from the front row, please. Thank you. PC board advisor in the department, the Directorate of Economics and Statistics, Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperation and Farmers Welfare, India. Uh, I really find this uh, presentation very interesting. Uh, the one on uh, the Bhutan's uh, experience, I just um, is not really very specifically related to the occasion, but I was wondering, given this kind of, uh, you know, uh, rather strong position of women in the farming in the farming in that country. How does it really relate to the sex ratio of that country at present? It's just a question related to because it, it is really so strong. It should also reflect on the sex ratio of that country also. So I this is just a um, maybe the not that related a question, but some, something interesting. Uh, if somebody can tell me from the delegate from the from Bhutan. Secondly, we all the time have been, you know, uh, grappling with the question of, because I'm from, from the Directorate of Economics and Statistics, and there one of the things that uh, we have all the time been facing is, you know, uh, the shortcomings of our cost of cultivation data mm. on the one side that we are trying to overcome by um, to remove the time uh, time lag by putting the entire system on something called farm map 2.0, shifting it from the earlier farm map to farm map to farm map 2.0, 1 to 2.0, in which we have shifted the entire thing from the old semi or very literally, very you know, partially automated system to completely internet worked uh, automated, completely automated solu solution. We have for the first time done our uh, uh, Ravi crop estimations on this new system. So, but the, this is one thing. But on the other hand, in uh, the case of, you know, <coughs> our crop cutting, this uh, advanced estimates, we have been again struggling with the, you know, issue of, you know, maybe that lack of uh, efficiency when it is left entirely on the traditional ways of doing the cost, uh, cost cutting uh, experiment. So when we see the kind of problems that, you know, uh, in that, uh, that um, uh, uh, satellite based data that has really was discussed in detail, but exactly we do not know to what extent this data, this, you know, uh, remote sensing based uh, technology can solve our problem in terms of, you know, more reliable, uh, you know, uh, information. 
when it comes to advanced estimating or forecasting data. So there also if somebody can throw more light. Okay, so we'll pass on the mics to uh, our presenters. So maybe, uh, Dr. Hugh, you want to start with answering the questions that were made to your presentation? Yeah. Thanks for the questions you asked, uh, how, how the s remote sensing is in my country. I'm sorry, please, please talk louder. And I just want to know what methodology will you implement in your country whenever the time comes in future, suppose in future. You stick with uh, crop cutting experiments or you will implement this new methodology of forecasting. You are not generating objective estimates of crop cutting experiments. You are forecasting means that is a associated with some kind of probability. It may be wrong, may be right. So you are going to implement that forecasted value for your policy decisions that I am asking about. Yeah, so quarterly I have uh, to write a forecast report and very short and send to the leaders of the Ministry of Agriculture. So in the past I meet many mistakes. So I don't know why, I don't know why, but generally I realize that the data that I receive from the local level to my center is something wrong somewhere. So last year, I took part in the workshop in Taiwan with uh, Dr. Nagras and many other people here. So I listened to the remote sensing technique, and I love physics when I was young. And I come back. I, uh, I work <coughs> with a company. He also worked, uh, take part in the Taiwan workshop, and I implement remote sensing in October 2018 for every month in Mekong River Delta region. It accounts for 50% of the total production of paddy in Vietnam, as, you, as you, you see on the slide. And I already suggest the leaders of the military apply this technology for paddy production, and then we have uh, better data for, for my quarterly use for forecast. I, I don't know if I answer this question. Okay. Uh, let me just no, answer it's that. The, it's, the, yeah. it's the using, because uh, I, I use only in Mekong River Delta region, mm -hmm. but not in the whole country. Okay. But it accounts for 50%. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. yeah. So we just did this as a pilot experiment just to see how remote sensing could actually be used uh, you know, as an alternative to traditional methods. The plan going forward with the Ministry of Agriculture is actually to uh, collect uh, field data, uh, be it crop cutting or farmer recall, routinely uh, for the next couple of years and then use that with field sensors, drones and other types of technology to develop methodology. Uh, but we can have a side discussion on this. Uh, let's maybe move on to the next presenter to ask, answer their uh, any questions uh, asked of them. Maybe, maybe Mr. Sadananda, right next oh, may, to Dr. Maybe I have, a, I have a, a very short answer. So when, when I compare, uh, I compare the data to the data source. Usually, the crop cutting is higher than the remote sensing, or administrative data is higher, maybe 20% higher than, so it's too high. So we, for me, it, it needs to check to, is to, 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 to choose which one is better. But the, the gap between the two data source is very high now, at least in the more than in the last 20 years, at the last 16 months. I, I collect it monthly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can answer the question asked of you. Uh, actually, uh, I am not uh, uh, expert to the ITC. Uh, it is done by the ITC division, but they take the responsibility to take care of the data, and I can uh, explain it. Uh, when we upload the data and download the data to from the machine, there are the password. It is very, very, I think, very difficult to uh, take other persons to data. But I think uh, your question is reason to do uh, reduce the response rate for the under the CAPI. Because uh, under the PEPI, we use a printed questionnaire and print it at the, the top of the uh, questionnaire, it is very, very confidential and data collected under the uh, statistical ordinance and not given data to the other part. 
uh, still the uh, persons believe it. I think, but the, this questionnaire can show all the persons and they can uh, take information. The second thing is that uh, the most of the sample we collect not confidential data, uh, especially the agriculture survey. Yeah, I think it is not confidential, the number of uh, lands and the land size, uh, uh, crop production, and uh, those things are not confidential. Although, but I think that the s data is secure in uh, uh, CAPI than the PEPI. Yes. And it is stored in? Sorry? It is stored in your own server. Yeah. Uh, yes. And uh, the second question is not clear. Uh, please ask this again. Okay. Your question? I don't have a question, but I'm going to add on to the, um, the answer to the data security issue. So in the case of Bhutan, uh, they didn't use survey solutions. They used CS Pro. Now, uh, I think your question on data security is not in terms of how the data is technically secured, but where is that data located? So you're looking at, uh, <coughs> did they have that uh, server located, say, on the World Bank server in um, the US? In the case of Bhutan, what they did was they housed their server nationally within the country in their national data center. Right? Now, the issue of security, right? as the data comes in, it's really up to the IT administrators of the, the unit of the ministry to ensure the security of that data as it is coming in. However, if the data is intercepted, it's not, gonna, it's not very easily interpretable. Right? They need to have the software on the other end to, in, to be able to make sense of that data as it's coming in. Without that, it's gibberish. Last but not least to Manisha to answer the question um, asked of her. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, sir, if I get your question right, uh, di did you mean uh, what was the situation of the gender in reference to uh, the overall country? Okay, uh, so as I mentioned that there, uh, in the results it was mentioned that they ha the, there was relatively high, higher um, ownership of land among women, right? Yes, yes, yes. Even uh, in the recent uh, land, uh, at a glance that we, uh, that the land com National Land Commission of Bhutan produced, there was uh, about 47% of the land was being owned by women. Uh, Manisha, if I can, if I can interrupt, the, qu the question is, in the population itself, okay. what's the percentage of women? Oh, uh, it's, among the among the agriculture population or uh, total population, it is forty seven percent of the population is women. Oh, sex ratio. <laughs> so uh, sorry, I need to get back on that. Um, If I can, it's close to one to one. The sex ratio in Bhutan is close to one to one. So the, the, find it, it, it's the, the, findings, the findings are based on the fact that there isn't much of a difference in a sex ratio. And uh, Manisha had uh, mentioned the constitution. What she hadn't mentioned is that all the policies and programs that have come out are based on a social framework built on gender equality. And this system of throms, although the act that, that she um, mentioned uh, was a 2007 act, is actually based on older acts. So the system of throms has been around for over 30 years. So it's a fairly mature registration system. And the gender equality policies are also um, something that's been implemented over a long period of time, which may explain why you see this really unusual gender equality in, in, uh, in female and male ownership. outcome of all that is happening for or against the woman. Yeah, so it, it would be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. If I can, I would like to thank everyone for their patience. Uh, I think we're 
almost close to being um, on time. We're a bit running a bit late, given the spillover. So I'm going to thank you all for your interest. Of course, the presenters are still around during the remaining sessions, so feel free, please, to discuss with them in person. Um, I do want to take just one minute. I know there's a lot of questions on remote sensing. We have the privilege to have with us uh, Dr. Kavinda Gunasekara from the Asian Institute of Technology, He's, who's been working in this area um, in the Geoinformatics Center for many, many years. So if people want to follow up as well on some of the work that they've done on crop yield estimation, um, soil analysis, and so forth, you're welcome to. Other than that, thank you again, and have a wonderful lunch and rest of the conference. Hello. Uh, I thank the chair and the co-chair for conducting this session. The lunch will be served at Front Lawn, so you can have your lunch now. And we'll be meeting for another session at 2 p.m. That will be conducted in this hall. Thank you.